Hello, my name is Bobke van der Werf. I work at the Center for Crop Systems Analysis in uh, Wageningen. And I want to tell you about research synthesis for intercropping using meta-analysis. And I'll be focusing on methods and metrics. This is uh, the Yellow River in uh, Gansu. Uh, this river uh, flows through uh, very uh, dry areas. So you can see on the other side of the river, there is uh, very little vegetation, but on the forefront, there is a lot of vegetation and that's agriculture. If we take a closer look at this, uh, we see that uh, crops are planted here in uh, strips and this is a form of intercropping. The farmers do strip intercropping. So apparently in this condition where there's flat land next to a river where they can irrigate and where they can fertilize, um, farmers pre uh, prefer intercropping to actually get uh, very high yields. And there's a variety of species here. Uh, there's soybean, uh, two rows of soybean here, and there's four rows of wheat, and this is strip intercropping. In another field, we can see uh, wheat uh, mixed with soybean, and the farmer has also planted um, maize here. And uh, the wheat will be harvested uh, fairly easily, and then after that, uh, the soybean and the maize will still be growing, and they'll fill the whole area. The farmer has also planted fruit trees, and uh, he's still using a diversity of crop species in the, in the area underneath these trees. This is another field. It has the soybeans here, and there's still a maize plant in the soybeans, and there's also uh, flax, and it's uh, used for oil. And there's actually a uh, diversity of systems, a big diversity. This is maize and wheat, uh, a popular system in Gansu. Uh, this is soybean and wheat. This is uh, potato and maize, which is uh, used in Yunnan province in the south. Uh, this system appears to be good for the production of both potato and maize, it, and it can help to control uh, Phytophthora, I've been told. <clears throat> and as I said, uh, the diversity of systems is uh, very large, and uh, these slides uh, try to illustrate. I want to talk to you about uh, <coughs> research synthesis and um, for research synthesis, we have basically three major ways to do that. The first of all is just to tell a story. It's the narrative review. That's the classical way to synthesize research, and it's based on an expert being often invited by a journal, <coughs> asking uh, asking the expert to, uh, to, to, to write up what is the state of the field, what do we know, what do we not know, and it builds on the expertise of uh, the, the person who writes it and his or, his or her overview of the topic. And he'll search relevant papers and he will select them and organize them and write them. But the risk exists that this, this uh, review could be biased because the personal preference gets in there. Because of this risk of uh, selection bias, um, people have come up with the idea of systematic review. A systematic review is based upon uh, developing a search equation that aims to find systematically all the evidence, all the relevant papers in a database like Web of Science or Scopus. Um, for the rest, this is very similar to the narrative review. Um, after you have all the papers, uh, you need to read them, uh, you organize the material, and you write your paper. Meta-analysis is an addition to that because it uh, it adds a 2D systematic review, a step of statistical data analysis to estimate quantities or test hypotheses. So what is meta-analysis then? Well, uh, the Greek uh, word meta, it means uh, um, up and beyond, it's uh, above something. Meta x means x about x. Metadata is data about data. A meta model is a model um, that captures a model. A meta analysis is an analysis of analysis. So it combines systematic review with statistical analysis. And the purpose is to assemble all the relevant studies dealing with a particular subject and to do that in an unbiased way. This originated in the medical sciences. Um, because in the medical sciences, oftentimes the stakes are very high. Um, 
there, there, there are big interests, uh, also commercial interests, whether certain medicines uh, work to treat a disease or don't work. And uh, because of this interest um, and for the for the for the care of patients, it's very important to uh, to synthesize the information to get the best overall outcome and assessment of the efficacy of treatments and of medicines. What are the steps in meta-analysis? Well, first of all, you need to formulate a research question. And after you know what you want to ask and which question you want to answer, you need to define possible metrics to express the quantities of interest. And this concerns both the dependent variables, so the left-hand side of equations, and the independent variables, so um, factors that influence your metrics of interest. You need to define the scope, so that's the population of studies. And you need to define what information you need from the literature. So if you uh, have defined all your papers, have, uh, have found them using the search term in Web of Science or Scopus, you need to define which of those papers you can actually use. And sometimes that's only 10% or even less. So to find the papers in the first place, you need to develop a search strategy that is, uh, well, that has uh, a good... Uh, yeah, that has a good ability to find all the relevant papers, but is not finding too many not relevant papers. And um, it is it's quite a, a quite a trick to, to figure out what is a correct search equation. And that takes a considerable uh, trial and error and uh, some systematic thinking about how to search. Then uh, when you figure that out, you conduct the search, um, you select the papers, you extract the data from the papers, you do the statistical analysis, which is oftentimes uh, quite a uh, lengthy and iterative process. Then when you're done with that, you interpret the analysis, answer the question, and write the paper. This is our first student uh, in, uh, in our group, uh, Yu Yang, who uh, did work on uh, meta-analysis on uh, intercropping and I'll uh, present several of his studies uh, because they illustrate very well how meta-analysis works. The question that Yu Yang asked is um, what is the worldwide average land equivalent ratio of intercropping? That seems uh, a strange question to ask. Uh, he asked that in 2010 because initially we thought we should know that, but we realized um, that we did not know that. Uh, some papers say it's 2.15 for this system, and then another paper said it's only uh, uh, one, one for this system, and, and, and there's a lot of contradictory information actually. So there is a great need for uh, synthesis and finding out what's the average. And if there's a high variability, what drives this variability? What are the factors that explain that? And Yu Yang's metric was the land equivalent ratio. So that is uh, the yield of the first species, Y1 in the intercrop, divided by the yield of the same species in the sole crop, M stands for monoculture, uh, plus uh, the yield of the second species, so it's a mixture of two species, uh, in the intercrop, Y2, divided by its sole crop yield, M2. So this first thing, Y1 over M1, is called the partial land equivalent ratio of species 1. It's also called the relative yield of species 1. And Y2 over M2 is the relative yield of species 2, also called the, relative, uh, the partial land equivalent ratio for that species. I'll uh, illustrate the concept of land equivalent ratio with uh, cotton wheat intercropping. Um, this, this intercrop is a relay intercrop uh, because uh, the wheat, uh, this is in uh, the province uh, Hebei in, uh, in China. The wheat is uh, sown in the autumn, is harvested uh, sometime in uh, June, and the, the cotton is only sown in April. So right here, this is probably in uh, April or May. The wheat is not mature, the, the strip for the cotton is empty, and uh, well, maybe six weeks later, the wheat is mature, uh, the cotton is in the seedling stage, then the wheat can be harvested using a combine because it goes over the top of the cotton seedlings. And after that, the cotton will take uh, the whole field and um, the, the, you can still the, see the stubble of the wheat here. Now, these strips of wheat that are growing here, um, they, they cover about 50% of the land area, but 
um, they can capture more resources than just 50% of the resources that are available in this field because the plants on the border have actually no competition. So they capture light from the sides, they can capture nutrients on the side, and they can also capture water on the side. And the same is true later for the cotton. So if you look at the yields in this system, uh, these are the sole crop yields for wheat. It's about six tons per hectare for cotton. At the time of the study, that was uh, 1,125 kilograms per hectare. And in the intercrop, you get about 60 to 70 of the sole crop yield for wheat and 60 to 80 percent of the sole crop yield for cotton. So in aggregate, you get um, maybe about uh, 120 to 150 percent of your uh, yeah, of your area worth of uh, of yield. To illustrate it in a different way, if you have one hectare of wheat cotton intercrop, that will give you the wheat yield of about 0 0.7 hectare of sole wheat and 0 0.7 hectare of sole cotton. And this is uh, this area, 1.4 divided by this area. That's uh, that is uh, that is your line equivalent ratio. <coughs> Now, when uh, Yu Yang did his uh, study, uh, this histogram shows uh, his uh, his result. Uh, the median value for the land equivalent ratio was 1.17. The average was 1.22, slightly higher than the median. And 50% uh, of the values was between 1.03 and 1.32. And actually, 75% or so of the values was bigger than one, but actually also 25% of the values was less than one. So not all intercropping is uh, is so great but a lot of intercropping is uh, is good so what were the steps in this uh, meta analysis well he uh, had a question so what is the worldwide average value of the LER in intercropping then he defined metrics and he used the LER and then as explanatory variables he used species choice nitrogen input temporal niche differentiation and I'll explain uh, how we defined that he defined the scope. Uh, it's worldwide. He used peer-reviewed studies, and they were in English. And he defined what information was needed. So he wanted data from field experiments with data from the sow crop and the intercrop treatments with comparable management and information on densities, sowing and harvest dates, and yields or relative yields. So he was not using uh, pot experiments, he was not using reviews, he was not using modeling studies, only field experiments with sufficient data to actually calculate the light equivalent ratio and also some potential explanatory factors related to uh, densities, temporal niche differentiation, input levels. This uh, slide illustrates uh, the search that he, uh, he did so we did a search uh, in uh, in May 2013 in the Web of Science core collection, and this is his, uh, these are his search terms, and he did that in the title, and he found 3,313 publications. Um, that's actually a staggering number of papers, and there's no way that anybody can do a, a meta-analysis, I think, on uh, more than 3,000 papers. Uh, a lot of meta-analysis uh, analyzed maybe around uh, 100 papers or if it's a big one, 130 papers, or if it's uh, a less big one, maybe 40 or 50 papers. Uh, 3,000 papers is a, it would be a staggering amount of work. Uh, Yu Yang then went on to uh, first analyze uh, the most highly cited papers from the literature. So clearly that's a biased sample. But after he did that, he, uh, he also took a random sample from the 3,000 papers that he found. And uh, from each uh, sample, he, uh, he selected papers until he had a sample of 50. Now, the selection process is illustrated in what's called a Prisma diagram. So for the top-sided sample, he started with 420 papers. Then he excluded conference proceedings and books. Um, he excluded non-English papers. He excluded review papers non-field experiments, papers only reporting perennial species, etc. So the PRISMA diagram is a very useful uh, diagram to actually illustrate which papers are qualifying for the meta-analysis and which papers are not qualifying. 
And the analysis, uh, most of his analysis, he did with uh, mixed effects models. Uh, mixed effects models account for uh, nesting in your data, and intercropping data is intrinsically nested because uh, you have, um, unl unless, um, unless you have uh, only one value per study, but actually in intercropping studies, we can usually extract multiple data from one study because uh, one study, one publication will have uh, multiple experiments, otherwise it's not easy to publish it. And then from every experiment, uh, there might be multiple treatments like uh, nitrogen levels or different species combinations. And every species combination on nitrogen level would result in a different record in the database. So this data is nested because um, <coughs> data collected in the same study uh, by the same authors with similar methods at the same place on the same soil, uh, they might have certain uh, attributes in common. So that, that's correlated data. and Mixed effects models can account for this correlation due to this uh, structure of the data. This is the result of uh, the land equivalent ratio in uh, the two uh, samples that Yu Yang had. Uh, very much to our surprise, um, uh, the results were identical. They, they were not similar, they, they were just uh, the same. So uh, the median value here, 1.17 for the top sided sample, 1.18 for the uh, uh, the random sample and uh, look at uh, the interquartile range from the first quartile 1.04 to the third quartile 1.32 is virtually the same in the other sample. So we concluded actually these two samples are uh, both uh, representative of the whole intercropping literature and that was later confirmed in other studies. This is an index that was uh, developed by Yu Yang. It's an index for temporal niche differentiation. Uh, here, this is the total growing period of the two species together. And for some period of time, they overlap, and then the species are competing for light, water, and nutrients. But in the beginning, this one is growing alone, <coughs> so it has a lot of space. Uh, here is growing, the second species is growing alone, it will have a lot of space. So um, this index is telling you to which extent the uh, intercropping system is actually a relay intercropping system. And we wanted to know whether this relay aspect is important for driving the land equivalent ratio. The answer was yes. Um, if you increase uh, T and D from zero to one, and zero means uh, no temporal niche differentiation, same growing period, one would mean uh, total difference in growing period, one is grown after the other. Um, all intercropping is between 0 and 1, and over that range, uh, you change your land equivalent ratio by 0 0.2 points. So that's a fairly large effect. You can also see from this figure that there's a lot of scatter around this average line. So T and D is not the only factor uh, explaining the land equivalent ratio. With the same data set, uh, um, uh, Yu Yang could also do... Uh, other analysis, he could ask some uh, new questions. So, for instance, uh, within this data set, about 75% of the records were serial legume intercropping because that's the most common type of intercropping used in the world. And he asked, what's the uh, trade off in yield between these uh, two component species? And can we use management, for instance, sowing date or densities or nitrogen input? to change how much cereal yield we get and how much legume yield we get. And usually the legume is more valuable. This shows this trade-off in yield. Uh, this is the partial land equivalent ratio of the legume. And here's the partial land equivalent ratio of the cereal. And you see um, the, the partial land equivalent ratio of the cereal declines when the partial land equivalent ratio of the legume is uh, increasing, although it never becomes zero. On the other hand, if you uh, increase the partial land equivalent ratio of the cereal, then actually uh, you have no yield of the legume there. So this is already indicating that uh, the cereal is more competitive than the uh, legume. This slide also illustrates that. Uh, this is the effect of sowing time. The smaller the value, the more to the left, the earlier the sowing. And for both uh, legumes, so the, the red points and the red line, and cereals, the black line and the black points, you see that the PLER goes up if you sow it before uh, the legume. 
uh, the other species, I should say. Um, and for the same relative sowing time, um, cereals are more competitive than uh, legumes, so they have greater relative yield. With the same data set, uh, yet another analysis based upon a quantile regression. It's another way to do something new with the data. And this explores uh, not the average response, because that's what statistical models usually do, is to model the average response and the variability around the average res response. This is directly estimating the quantiles of the response. And this tau is 0 0.5. That means this is the median. So the median value of LER, how it depends upon the T and D, but also the 90% point of the LER that, that you will get at the given T and D. So that was also an interesting effort. Now, another interesting thing that, uh, that we did with um, meta-analysis was to analyze other metrics than LER. And uh, there's a lot of metrics, and every metric really represents uh, a question. Um, if you have reduced need for land uh, for the same product output, uh, you're very likely to reduce your need for water because, uh, yeah, if you water more land, you're probably going to use more water. And the same for nitrogen input and phosphorus input and actually for anything. So concentrating your production on a smaller land area is likely to result in resource saving. That's expressed in a, a formula that we uh, call the FNER, Fertilizer Nitrogen Equivalent Ratio. Here you have the formula for the LER. Uh, we've seen that before. Uh, and the land equivalent ratio is answering the question, um, which area of uh, soil crops would I need to get the production that I get in um, in an intercrop, and it's it's given by this uh, this formula. It's based upon the, the yields that you obtain in the intercrop and in the sow crop. For uh, the fertilizer nitrogen equivalent ratio, you ask a similar question. You would ask, um, given the yields that I get in a, in a sow crop in a unit area, and given how much fertilizer I use there, if I move that production to sow crops, how much fertilizer would I use then? And if I take the ratio of those two fertilizer uses, what is it? If you uh, spend some time on thinking about this, uh, this is the formula that uh, will give you the answer. It's, it's partly based upon the, uh, the relative yields obtained in intercropping, and it's partially based upon the, the relative uh, fertilizer inputs that you have in the sow crops and in the intercrops. And um, if you look at the, uh, the data there, and this is for uh, May soybean intercropping. The land equivalent ratio is already high, but the fertilizer nitrogen equivalent ratio is even higher. And that is so because um, um, you can uh, moderate your uh, your nitrogen input in, uh, in the intercrop, and that's what people have done. Usually the intercrop uh, nitrogen input is the average of the soil crop inputs, but you get a lot of May yield and relatively less soybean yield. And if you then look at uh, what that means in terms of nitrogen, actually you've, you've produced a lot of yield for less nitrogen. So you have a substantially nitrogen savings there. Now, these ratios, uh, like land equivalent ratio and nitrogen fertilizer equivalent ratio, they, they also are somewhat um, uh, potentially misleading because um, their ratios, uh, their dimensionless numbers, or maybe if you think about it, uh, the, the LER is uh, area of sow crop that you need per unit uh, of uh, intercrop, but actually it's difficult to understand. And uh, then there's an alternative metric that's called uh, the net effect or the net biodiversity effect, and it's the difference between the observed yields, Y1 and Y2, in intercropping, and the expected yields. And the expected yields are certain proportions, P1 and P2, times the sow crop yields, M1 and M2. And the P1 and P2, they add to 1, so they represent the uh, proportion of the area that is used for planting uh, the species 1, P1, and the proportion of the area used for planting with species 2. So you subtract the expected yield from the observed yield for species one, you subtract the uh, 
expected yield from the observed yield for species two. If both are grain yield, um, the, you, you can add them. It's not ideal, but you can add them. And uh, if you do that, you get the uh, net effect. Um, the net effect was, uh, was used in a paper here on uh, uh, the uh, uptake of phosphorus and the advantage of using uh, intercropping. This is the land equivalent ratio for P uptake. It's well above one. This is the net effect for P uptake, and it uh, shows that on average, you have a, a five kilogram per hectare greater phosphorus uptake in your uh, biomass than you would expect based upon the uh, the soil crops. And the LER for yield is uh, is uh, actually the same as the LER for uh, for uh, phosphorus uptake. If you look at the conversion of this uh, phosphorus that was uh, taken up by the by the canopy and how it's converted to yield, actually the points for soil uh, soil crops, so the the red closed circles are uh, soil cereals, the blue closed circles are soil legumes, and the open symbols in the same color are the intercrop uh, points. Um, these are on the same line, so the conversion efficiency is the same. So this analysis shows that uh, for phosphorus, intercropping does uh, improve the acquisition of phosphorus. Uh, it does not change the conversion of phosphorus to, uh, to yield. Now, it, it doesn't mean that um, uh, increased phosphorus uptake is driving the yield increase. Um, it's just meaning that um, in intercropping, you have this yield increase, uh, a land equivalent ratio that's well above one, and that um, is associated with a phosphorus fertilizer uptake ratio that's also well above one. And uh, so th these things are associated. The question as to what causes what is a very difficult then the net effect was also used in another uh, study. This is a study by uh, Li Chunji, uh, published in Nature Plants. Um, it shows the uh, effect of maize on yield gain in intercropping. So the the red uh, bars here is the net effect for uh, systems that do have maize, and the blue points are systems that don't have maize. And the net effect is substantially smaller on average for the systems that do not have maize than for the systems that do have maize. And that's illustrated here. This is the net effect. Uh, these bars represent the average net effect for systems with maize and without maize, and it's much greater for systems with than without maize. Nitrogen has some influence on that, not, a, not an overriding influence. Uh, systems with maize have bigger net effect if they have high nitrogen input. Systems without maize have somewhat bigger net effect if they have low nitrogen input. The important differences uh, between systems with maize and uh, without maize are, uh, for instance, the temporal niche differentiation, uh, quite high in systems with maize, which means that they are mostly relay and um, much lower in systems without maize, which means they're mostly simultaneous. Also, the, uh, the fertilizer input and the nitrogen in systems with maize, on average, is a lot higher than in systems without maize, uh, three times. But the phosphorus input is, uh, is very similar. So these, these systems with maize and without maize uh, do not um, we, we cannot say the difference in that effect is due to the inclusion of maize. Uh, it could also be due to the, uh, the difference in T and D, and it could also be due to the difference in fertilizer input. Actually, these things are um, uh, totally linked. It's a whole syndrome of production in intercropping. And uh, that was uh, how, the, how the paper was framed. Uh, so do, do we, we can see that there are very different systems of, of intercropping that really have different traits, have different attributes, have probably very different production ob objectives. Systems with maize that have high yield and high net effects, high nitrogen input that are relay, so it's a high input, high output syndrome. Systems without maize have lower yield, lower net effect, uh, lower nitrogen input also, mostly simultaneous, uh, also simultaneously harvested, whereas the relay intercrops need to be separately harvested. Uh, 
and with low input, low, low output syndrome. Um, this allows you the intensive system to uh, have high yield per unit area, even higher than you would have in sow crops. Uh, the system uh, without maize um, allows you to have uh, yields with uh, with low input, and uh, this this could be more environmentally benign. But for a given production objective, you would need more land. This would require less land. Uh, I'm not going to say what's better. Um, it's just very very different. So meta analysis and intercropping. Uh, where do we go from here? Um, there, there's a lot of questions that are still uh, not answered. Um, does intercropping save water? Uh, yeah, there are papers out there that uh, that show that, but no no meta analysis uh, has been done. So on average, we don't know how much, and we also don't know what are key factors that uh, that drive this. The meta analysis is still needed. Uh, does intercropping reduce pests, diseases, and weeds? Um, we, we have several meta-analyses uh, ongoing on uh, this topic, and uh, yes, it uh, does uh, substantially decrease all these things. And uh, well, we, uh, we, we can hear about that in, uh, in other presentations. Um, it's very interesting. Then a third question is, how can we achieve high yield gain from intercropping uh, with low input? And what does the data in the literature tell? Um, actually, I, I don't th I don't think we, we we have the answer to this question yet. So we need further work to uh, to uh, yeah to to analyze this. So just to uh, to warn you, uh, meta analysis is a lot of work. It's uh, not something that you can do uh, quickly. Uh, the whole process of uh, finding papers, extracting the data, analyzing the data is uh, is um, is, is, is a lot of work. Uh, there's a rigorous procedure. Um, it's neither quick nor easy. There's even a paper in the, in the literature that has this title, Meta-Analysis, Neither Quick Nor Easy. It's, um, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bucket of work, but it's, uh, it's very interesting to do. And um, the surprising thing about meta-analysis is that is being framed as a kind of synthesizing what we already know, but in my experience, uh, that's really not what it is. Um, by by bringing data from different sources together, it actually allows you to make uh, new synthesis and to make new discoveries. So I, I think it's a very fascinating and very uh, exciting uh, area of uh, of work. So um, yeah, so I. Uh, I, I would recommend uh, trying to do meta-analysis, but you need to set aside uh, substantial time because it, it really is a lot of work. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. It uh, was a pleasure to talk about this because it's a fascinating topic. And here's the slide with some of the cited references uh, in chronological order. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, interest.